My guest this week is Vinod Khosla. Uh, Vinod is the founder of Khosla Ventures, where he focuses on investing in bold technology ideas that can disrupt massive industries. He was previously a co-founder of Daisy Systems and a founding CEO of Sun Microsystems, where he pioneered open systems and commercial risk processes. Vinod is not just a successful entrepreneur and investor. At his core, he is a mentor and an advisor driven by a desire to create positive change through technology. He has a passion for empowering entrepreneurs and believes business can be a force for good. Vinod, welcome into the single verse. It's great to be here. You know, Vinod, uh, you and I have spoken about it. Um, as I was growing up in India and, uh, you know, doing computer science and, uh, you know, you were always an inspiration for all of us. Uh, you had started... Uh, a company that we all uh, looked up to and later I worked for, which was uh, Sun Microsystems. And uh, so tell us a little bit about your early life and the leading up to Sun and the idea uh, around Sun. Um, and uh, and that'll, be, uh, that'll be a good way to get this conversation started, I suppose. You know, one thing that's always intrigued me is starting a company. A long, long time ago, I read the story of Intel starting up and... Uh, Andy Grove, a Hungarian immigrant, starting that company in Silicon Valley. Um, that ca caught a fire in my imagination and convinced me to go start a company. Uh, <laughs> as soon as uh, I was done with college, I actually jumped uh, into wanting to do a startup, came to Silicon Valley, did my first startup which is a CAD tools company called Daisy Systems. Quite successful, went IPO, did very well. Uh, three of us started it. Um, what I realized was there was no computing platform uh, on which one could develop applications like Daisy. So we spent more money developing our platform uh, on which to build the CAD applications. And I was an electrical engineer. Uh, <laughs> then we spent on the application itself. And that's what got me to think about starting a platform company. Looked around, saw the technology at uh, Stanford. Sun actually stands for Sun University, Net Stanford University Net, uh, was, which was where the name came from. Yep. And, and so that was pretty exciting, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, one thing that I've always found in uh, our conversations for you, impossible is just an opinion. And I think uh, you made a lot of things that uh, seemed impossible, absolutely not only possible, but uh, part of everyday life. Uh, you know, Vinod, I've always uh, admired your vision around uh, seeing around corners uh, into the future, some would say. And um, and I remember, I think it was almost 10, 12 years ago when you wrote an article which said, uh, you know, doctors are going to be a thing of the past. So uh, just just to have a little provocative uh, mm -hmm. start to this conversation, what are your next uh, couple of predictions about uh, the next 10, 20 years? You know, one of the things uh, technology always excited me was how much transformation it can drive. Um, when I started Sun, which we just talked about, uh, the microprocessor was just coming on the scene and it sounded silly to me. And that was the whole crux of the idea of Sun. It sounded silly to me that in a digital equipment corporation, Wax, most people don't remember the company, which was the dominant computer company, maybe the number two computer company in the world after IBM. Uh, you had to take a processor roughly the same power and share it among lots and lots of users when it cost $100 for a microprocessor. That, that idea led to Sun. You know, but it also led to the idea of TCP IP. So Sun adapted TCP IP in 1982. And I've seen these transformations go on um, from time to time. As I argue, 
uh, when I said in 19, uh, in 1982, if you had a desk at Sun, you were required to have email. None of the pink slips for messages. Uh, that was 1982, and uh, people laughed when I said in 1985, grandma would will, will use email or a PC. You know, it's constantly been the case. When 1995 came along, uh, we bet on TCPIP as an exponential growth technology. Um, when every major telco I talked to said, Two things. Uh, I actually remember AT&T telling me nobody needs more than ISDN at home, 64 kilobits. And TCP IP is too flaky a system, uh, so we will use ATM technology. 1996, we started Juniper. Uh, this large technology transformation has always gone on. And, uh, and what it takes is some sort of driver uh, usually an instigator, an individual who causes all that change to happen. Um, come back to your question. I've seen these large transformations brought around by technology, and literally nobody believed TCPIP was important in 1996 when we started Juniper, which was a natural succession to Sun. As you remember, Sun used to say the network is the computer. Um, we needed a networking tool like TCPIP, and Juniper was a 2,500x return um, on a $3 million kind of investment, initial investment, which is about $7 billion in return. That was in those days, in the 90s. Um, I have followed these trends constantly, um, and we can talk about them in any dimension and there's infinite dimensions to go to. But it was in 2012, I first wrote two blogs that you're talking about. One was called, Do We Need Doctors? And the second was called, Do We Need Teachers? And to be fair, I imagined humans doing the human element of medical care and the human element of education, which is probably 10% or 20% of what they do today. I didn't think I wanted to eliminate them, in fact, my big paper was then called 20% Doctor Included for the human element of care. But the idea that a physician can keep up with the last 5,000 articles on breast cancer when they're treating a breast cancer patient, the research studies, is, is preposterous. We have too much information for humans to keep them in their head. And when you start connecting things like cancer patients with uh, cardiac disease, with other uh, diseases, it gets extremely complex. So I've always imagined complexity will be high, uh, handled by computers. And um, five years ago, when it was not very hot, we invested in open AI. Oh. So uh, it's been exciting to see the vision of doctors and teachers come together. My wife uh, runs CK12, a nonprofit that's doing AI tutors for every kid on the planet. And I believe they can be near free. Uh, my son's working on uh, a primary care doctor, which I'm very, very excited about. But we also have companies working on cardiologists and physical therapists and frankly, all manner of human expertise. That's sort of within the AI domain. <laughs> I would say... There's so many other domains in which technology can make a difference. I'm quite convinced we can replace cost-effectively every coal and natural gas plant in this country well before 2050 using fusion. So we are working on fusion. Um, I, I think we can replace the majority of cars in most cities with a very different notion of public transit radically reinvented where it's always faster than cars, always on demand, not on a schedule. Um, and it can get from anywhere to anywhere in a, at a very cost-effective price. Um, in fact, uh, you know, no matter where I look, that's possible. I think the sources of food 
plant proteins uh, will change radically over the next 25 years, in my view. I think in uh, AI-based intelligence, we'll see probably a billion bipedal robots within the next 25 years. So I could go on and on. Music and entertainment will be reinvest, uh, reinvented. Uh, climate is, of course, a big issue. Lots of work to do there. So I could go on forever. Yeah, that, that is very, very fascinating. Uh, what do you think? Do you think uh, in our lifetime or in the next couple of decades, uh, you would see the 20% uh, developer uh, emerge, so as to speak, uh, taking from your 20% doctor included? <laughs> uh, almost certainly it'll happen. The way I would think about the software developer, I think everybody below the median developer will be eliminated, maybe mm. a higher number. That will become natural language programming, which we are starting to see. Uh, below that. You know, you shouldn't need to write SQL. You should ex explain what you want, and the system writes the SQL and accesses the database. Um, the great developer become, will become excellent, and the 10x developer will be way more powerful than they are today. You will need developers to architect systems. You will need 10x developers to visualize highly complex systems. So I do think they'll have a pretty large role, but hugely amplified. In my bet is the top 10% of developers would do more work than 100% of developers today. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. So, you know, at the, it's like, we're talking at the bottom end. A, sip, a system like Replit, I don't know if you're familiar with the system or your audiences, will allow a billion people to become programmers because it'll be close to natural language. So what what sort of, uh, and I've asked you this question, I've been fascinated by your response to this. You know, I'm, um, I'm a father of four and uh, two of my older kids are pursuing uh, STEM-related studies in uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, so if you, you, you think that Education and computer programming is still uh, something that you would uh, encourage uh, youth to get into, or you think there are other domains that you would encourage them to so seek? So let me suggest the following. Uh, as a general direction, not 100% truth. The need to work in human society will disappear. People will work because they want to work, on what they want to work on, not because they need to work to earn an income. So suddenly, even the artists will become a better job because they are doing it for their passion. Um, having said that, and I often get asked, uh, how, how should people train for this world? And I think the most important thing is to develop the mind properly for young people. And I do think computer science, engineering, and STEM in general develops the mind in ways that is going to be generally more useful. My advice today is don't get become a specialist in one narrow area. Do as broad an education as possible, at least at the undergraduate level. Then if you want to do a PhD in electrical engineering or biotechnology, that's fine. But try and uh, do something broad so you can pivot into a number of different areas. You know, the whole notion of chips and software at the scale didn't exist when I went to college in 1971. Um, but I've been... Because of my broad training and my master's degree was in biomedical engineering after my degree in electrical engineering, and then I got an MBI, uh, I was able to move as the world of technology moved and able to pursue my passion to have technology have more and more impact. So I talked about uh, how Sun started. It was very, very tactical. It was nothing super strategic. But over time, I've realized the power of technology.
to make a huge positive difference on humankind, whether it is on energy production, infusion, or uh, better sustainable aviation fuel, uh, you pick your area, or food sources. So what I would say is get as broad an education and, uh, and, and keep learning. So learn enough to keep learning new areas and develop a certain style of thinking in your brain and you will be able to respond as the world changes and it will change. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, uh, you know, just, um, you know, getting onto the topic of entrepreneurship, uh, you've probably been one of yourself, not probably, you've been one of yourself and also partnered with uh, legendary uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, one of the reasons I became an entrepreneur was because of you and the conversation you and I had a few years ago. Um, so what, what do you, what do you think are the key attributes, characteristics that makes a successful entrepreneur, um, in your, in your opinion? So I would say entrepreneurs generally are optimistic. Skeptics never did the impossible. Um, can you imagine this? You can give a hundred reasons why Elon Musk couldn't be successful at starting a car company, let alone an EV car company, which didn't exist practically back then. Um, so, entrepreneurs are um, optimistic. I think entrepreneurs have very rapid learning rates. They get in the field and they engage. And they rapidly iterate and adjust what they're doing. And you look for those characteristics. Um, they have a passion for their vision, but yet seek lots of input and are willing to adjust their vision as input comes in. It's an unusual combination. They're obstinate and they're really flexible. Uh, I would say obstinate, really good entrepreneurs are very obstinate about their vision and very flexible about their tactics. So a couple of characteristics, they also build awesome teams. They're not afraid to hire strong teams. That is, yeah, one of the advice that you gave me was, um, Raj, it's like a Formula One driver. <laughs> if you go too fast, you'll crash. If you go too slow, you'll lose the race. And that's something I grapple, uh, grapple with almost on a daily basis. But your your advice has been very, very useful. Um, your take on innovation has always been uh, intriguing to me. You tell the story about one of the uh, one of the companies you were on the board of, um, and they raised some money, and you said something like, uh, "Yeah, let's raise an extra fifty million, as long as you are ready to quote unquote waste it." Um, tell us a little bit about entrepreneurs and innovation, and their um, almost addiction to innovation, and how that has changed. Um, the the trajectory of companies. You know, people don't like failing. And I like to say my willingness to fail is what causes me to succeed. Um, and the big difference is unless you try risky things, you're not going to do things different than everybody else. The market is very competitive. And hence, one area in which you can differentiate is take larger risks for larger changes and larger innovation. Now, the key to that is if you fail, you don't want to lose your company. So you want to take risks, which might set you back a little bit. But if they succeed, they double the market value of or market opportunity of your company. So asymmetric risks, very much in the Nassim Taleb sense, is what matters. And he's written on this topic. Um, I always say, if you took half a percent or one percent of your market cap, and that applies to a five-person company and a five-thousand-person and fifty-thousand-person company, if you take half a percent of your market cap and put it on ten projects. <laughs> Every time you lose, you lose half a percent of your market cap. But if you win, you double your market cap. Uh, I'll give you a classic example. You know, at Square, Square Cash was this thing that 
was one of these experiments and now is the dominant part of what I think is perceived as the company's market cap. And other invest experiments that failed um, shouldn't really count. So I like to say failure doesn't count if it's intelligent failure and the right size of failure. I'm very, very excited by this notion that you can encourage people to try things that might fail, may even be likely to fail. But if you try enough of them, you have 5% downside in this formula and 500% upside. Yeah, no, this is, that has been a very valuable lesson for me personally. And here at Single Store, I think our, our success, uh, our model success is greatly attributable to the rate of innovation and our um, addiction to that. So, um, so thanks for that advice. Um, naturally, um, the topic of AI is extremely hot right now. Um, you saw around corners there. Um, tell us about um, you know your first experience when you started hearing about or okay. uh, spoke to OpenAI and the vision and uh, what got you to back them. Uh, I believe you're one of the largest investors uh, in OpenAI. Um, and then the second part of the question, of course, is uh, where do you see um, open AI and AI at large going uh, in, in the next few years or the next decade or so? Well, so thing one has to do is bet when others aren't betting on something. You know, we've seen hot trends and everybody's doing the same thing and then you get bubbles. We've seen that repeatedly over the last 40 years I've been dealing with innovation. So you have to decide what is important, will have a large impact, and sustain through ups and downs. I would say, I wouldn't use the word it was very clear to me, but it was clear to me that it was likely not guaranteed that AI would have a huge impact. And so about five years ago, when we invest in OpenAI, uh, 10 years ago is when I'd written about the idea and thought about, do we need doctors' uh, expertise? Do we need teachers to teach students? And all kinds of other things from robotics, which is really dependent on AI intelligence to uh, drug discovery and all those other areas of AI. So we placed the bet. In fact, we placed the largest bet I've ever placed in the 40 years I've been in venture capital by a factor of two. The largest initial bet I've placed in 40 years by a factor of two. Um, wow. And that has worked out very well. But it was this belief that AI would, was going to be important. And there was no real hot trend then. It wasn't this area where every corporation, every investor had to be in AI. And that's the right kinds of bets to place. Uh, I think it's going to affect all aspects of our life. But what I would say in an encouraging way here is we're not done with AI. We are less than 10% of the journey towards AGI. And my personal belief, even sitting here today, is large language models will be very, very important, but not the only AI technique. So we are spending time on what might look like a large language model four years from now. Um, for example, we've invested in symbolic logic, probabilistic programming techniques to achieve uh, you know, the kinds of Bayesian thinking human beings do. So I look at human intelligence and types of human intelligence from creativity to logic and reasoning to others. Um, very likely, these, some of these things will emerge in large language models as emergent behavior of those models. But it's also very likely there'll be other add-ons that help AI become more versatile, broader, and eliminate most of the criticism you see today. You know, skeptics point to what's wrong with it today. I always tell our team, 
look two years out and most of the problems you're dealing with will be much, much smaller. Whether it's hallucination or the occasional logical or reasoning error. I'll give you an example. There are people training coding. Pro Nobody imagined LLMs could code five years ago. Write code. Um, I think that capability will significantly enhance or get much better over the next five years. We are far from done. So, you know, I don't think people will ever do an API integration. They'll just tell the AI to do an integration for them. And APIs may still be needed, but the English language will be the way you do an integration. Just tell it to integrate. And if it needs clarity, it'll ask you those questions. I would venture to guess half of IT departments 15 years from now will be gone. I only point to the following fact. In the 1920s, I believe, most corporations in the U.S. had a VP of electricity. Those roles are gone. I'm not suggesting the CIO will be gone, but half of the IT function. You know, take the very common function of BI or business intelligence. You have a business user who specifies something that they want done. The data analyst then tries, turns it into SQL and into a query. Business analyst should be able to say, hey, do this report for me. They could go beyond and say, in the last three months or last quarter's data, what should I be paying, looking at? What's an anomaly? So they don't even know the question they should be asking or the report. And AI should be able to answer a question without IT people involved. So I do think we're going to see a very, very different world coming up. Uh, much more capability, much less IT, uh, much fewer IT people. Um, you'll still need 20%, uh, hugely amplified by AI. Uh, so, all very exciting. So, uh, probably uh, coming to the end of our time with you, um, I've always sought your advice um, as, as a CEO. What advice do you have for us leaders um, in tech or otherwise um, in, in this fast evolving field of AI, do you think the notion of leadership and organizations and organization structure will change dramatically over the next decade or so? And if so, what are some of the things that you should look out for um, to be successful? You know, a decade is a short time in which to see some of these changes, uh, some of the things I'm talking about, how you handle business processes in your company, uh, that will change well within the 10 years. Uh, you won't need a UI path or automation anywhere or those kinds of clunky old systems. Uh, I think you'll still need great data architecture in a company. I think you'll mostly from a leadership point of view, change the culture from tomorrow is going to be like yesterday, which is sort of a good paradigm for most people. What has worked for the last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years will probably not work. Whether it's in marketing, whether it's in product design, it's the kind of people you have. Uh, and just because it's ambiguous as to what you will need, doesn't mean you will not need to change. And leadership will be about putting a much more dynamic thinking organization, stretching their thinking, have them look at what might uh, come from left field to affect your business. It's that kind of organization, which is very, very different from I know in five years, it'll still be our business kind of approach to life and will be dominant. In fact, for incumbents, uh, 
their existing customers will be a huge advantage in making a transformation and being the consultant that brings all the latest approaches uh, to them. That's the recipe for growth, the recipe that says I have my customers locked in and I can be insulated. Uh, that won't work very much. That's great. So, uh, you know, you've always uh, surprised me as to how you sort of um, drink your own champagne or eat your own dog food in terms of innovation. And you're telling me a story about how you use AI uh, a lot more than uh, most common people do and how you wrote a song for your daughter's uh, either upcoming wedding or wedding. And uh, how did that go? And um, why don't you share that experience with our listeners? I'm probably in the bottom one percentile of people when it comes to music capability. Um, and my daughter's wedding was in my in May, and I used chat. Uh, I I I wrote what a talk about what the speech I was going to give, like most fathers. But then I told ChatGPT to turn that speech, that emotion I wanted to express, into a rap song. And it did the lyrics. I then entered the lyrics into a new AI called Splash.ai that did the whole rapping, the instrumentals, the voice, the singing, the whole bit. So I was able to play a very, very personal message in a rap song, a capability I couldn't even remotely have imagined. And that's a great example. I didn't have that capability, now I do. Well, that's 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 great. And uh, was there a big round of applause at the end of that? <laughs> oh, people loved it. The quality was really high. I'd recommend everybody trying trying this. No, well, that's 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 fascinating. Uh, you know, the the stage is yours for any concluding uh, remarks that you might have. I might give you a couple of parting comments. I think. Because of the exponential rate of growth in technology, the next 10 years, we will see more change than we've seen in the last 25 years. So if you want to look at how different 20, 2033 will be from today, 2023, you have to go back into the 1990s and say how different is today from 1990s. That's a good way to think about it. The implication is leaders will have to be much more dynamic in their thinking, much more dynamic in their organization. So we are used, as, uh, used, used to, as engineers, optimizing systems by X or Y, most throughput in the database. My bet is future IT systems, future organizations, future company configurations will be optimized for change, not for optimizing a particular function. And that's a good way to think about it. My last comment would be, I find most people are more limited by what they think they can do than what they can actually do. You know, I, I've just been fascinated by you know, you said entrepreneurs and you said thought leaders, much like yourself, you have something which, you know, um, I don't know if I'll ever have um, or if it can be learned. Um, and I, I've been fascinated by some of the routines that um, gifted individuals like you sort of follow. So if you don't mind, uh, what what's your morning routine look like? Well, my routine is pretty flexible. I make sure... I get enough exercise, which is usually hiking. We were talking about it earlier. Um, so it's my favorite form of exercise because I can both exercise, uh, go on a three mile hike, and I like to go uphill a lot uh, so I can uh, maximize cardiac uh, exercise uh, in the shortest period of time. And it's also a great way to listen to podcasts and learn something. That's sort of almost my uh, salvation away from the office and email and all those things. 
uh, those things mm, uh, keep me clean and fresh in my head. I just thought about this. Uh, I remember this was about seven years ago or something like that. You and I first met and it was a quote unquote interview uh, for, for a CEO. Actually, it was from MC Equal. And uh, it was by far and away the most unusual interview uh, I've ever had because the normal things are about, you know, jobs and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, I came out just completely fascinated because it was like an interview I had never had before because you didn't ask me any question that I've been asked in all my previous interviews. What do you sort of, how do you interview? What's, what's your thought process when you're interviewing a candidate for, say, one of your portfolio companies? You know, connecting it back to the idea that we need to be in a dynamic world, uh, Whenever I ask somebody what they did in their last job, they know what answer to give. You know, everybody's smart enough to say, I did X and Y, and I don't know among the 100 people in the company, in that department, who was responsible for what, but everybody knows how to take credit and give the right answer. So it is very, very misleading to ask them about their last five jobs, and it's useful but what I like to do is interview people in, in contexts that they haven't thought about before, because I'm trying to understand how they think about things. Uh, for example, if I say, if you joined Startup X, how would you approach this problem? Uh, new contexts are very valuable in learning how somebody thinks and how will they think. Saying who are the three people you would hire and why tells me what kind of team they will build and how, uh, why they would select that team. So one has to be indirect in an interview. Uh, the goals are the same. I'm trying to understand how people think, how dynamic they will be, how well can they do in a context which they don't understand? Uh, you know, what's the first principles thinking they're showing, even in areas they don't know? Um, what kind of team they will hire? Um, so I ask a lot of hypothetical questions, not what they've done in the past, what they've already thought about, already know the glib answer for. So I have a fairly unusual technique to determine what fundamentally are people like. Yeah, and uh, and that was, you know, that was probably the most thinking I had to do in an interview <laughs> in my life. But it got me here, so thank uh, you for you that. You know, I've heard that comment from many an interview I've done. I, I was stretched hard to think about things I didn't know about. <laughs> you know, you, you really did. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, as I said, it's a privilege and an honor to have you here. Uh, thanks for your mentorship. And um, yeah, I wish you all the very best uh, for the day and uh, for the year ahead. Well, it's great to be here. And I hope your, I say to your audience, uh, they got something out of this and they can imagine the possible and then try and make that happen with technology. It's a wonderful way to live. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.